It's our first podcast. We're allowed to do stupid stuff. Are you kidding? I plan on doing stupid stuff for like the entirety of the podcast. <laughs> Speaking of that, hi everybody, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. First episode. Until we think of a better name. Yeah, we're kind of bad about that. <laughs> I'm going to adjust my seat because I'm jammed in next to the guitar rack. Yeah, and a big guy. Rock in a hard place, I guess. That's I'm, true. I'm the hard place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we plan on talking about all kinds of, of things over the course of the next ever. Yeah. Uh, but our first topic was to sort of get to get to know each other, get to know you, have you get to know us, and talk about self improvement. Self improvement, yeah. I promise, no hokey advice, almost none. Maybe. Maybe. Just, maybe just a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, so we'll, do you want us to kick off how, uh, how sure. you celebrate? All right. Yeah, we'll kick off with an icebreaker. Um, and I picked a question because I know Ryan has an elaborate ritual for it, which is how do you celebrate your birthday? All right. So uh, you want me to explain first then? Well, I, I'll go first. All right. Um, because mine will, my, mine doesn't take very long. I celebrate my birthday by forgetting about it until about a week before. And then someone, one of my friends will say to me, Hey, are you doing anything for your birthday? And I will think, no, I'm probably not doing anything for my birthday. And I will think, man, I really want to do something for my birthday. And at some point in the next like week, we wind up all at a pub and we have dinner and it's a pretty good time. And that is, I don't get presents because I don't really want them. I talk myself out of them. And that is how I celebrate my birthday. I may need to work on that. Yeah, it was kind of an awkward trail off at the yeah. end. Yeah. That's all right. Ryan, how do you celebrate your birthday? Uh, so... I kind of created this somewhat elaborate ritual. Um, it started out of uh, a realization that on Facebook, when people know when it's your birthday, it can get really tedious to reply. Because I feel like if people make the effort, it, as whatever <laughs> effort is on social media, if they make the effort to wish me a happy birthday, then you know you should just reply to every individual person. So I'd spend you know a good chunk of the day just going and you know thanks a lot or try to give a personalized comment and then i suppose because i feel like i'm more important than what i am one year i'm like you know what would happen if facebook wasn't there to to remind everybody it was my birthday like who who would actually wish me a happy birthday if they didn't know about it so a couple years ago i ran a pseudo experiment and right before midnight on my birth or the, the day before my birthday i deactivated facebook and I was actually scared because I didn't know what would happen to my stuff when I deactivated it. So since then, I've discovered it. it's there. Thanks, Facebook. But it's not there. So I deactivated it. And you know what? The world didn't end. And I didn't mind so much that I didn't get completely slammed with well wishes. And I realized that there was the people who did remember, my family and really close friends, it meant more that they seemed to have remembered without Facebook. But then I realized, you know, a lot of the interactions that I had with people on Facebook where it's almost always on my birthday. It was always, you know, like once a year they say happy birthday to me, I say happy birthday to them kind of deal. And uh, so, yeah, I started off by just get rid of Facebook for the day, just 24 hours, and I turn it back on because I like my social media. Uh, and I don't know what I would do at work if I didn't have Facebook always open and constantly refreshing. So, so yeah, I deactivate Facebook. Um, I try to get up early, relatively early, so like, 6 a.m. maybe not is the most earliest, but I, I try to get up at about 6. Um, I try to do some kind of physical activity. Um, if I was ever really ambitious, I'd go to the gym. But since I don't go to the gym, I just try to go for a walk. Um, equal parts meditation and just out enjoying nature. I have a December birthday, so that can sometimes be pleasant Hazardous. or unpleasant, Yeah, depending on when, what's going on. Um, I try to buy a book for myself and I've gotten into the habit of buying biographies of famous people that I want to learn something about their development or their, uh, how they, how they grew up and how they improved themselves, which makes it a convenient topic for this first podcast. Um, I usually write, uh, at least one journal entry for the day and it will be some kind of one year reflection or where I'm at right now. 
Um, did this last year work out really well for me? Uh, New Year's, even though I have a birthday in December, New Year's really isn't all that big of a deal for me in terms of like a yearly resolution. But birthday to birthday is seems less arbitrary to me. Or at least it's arbitrary, but it's arbitrary to me because it means something to me. Um, so a journal entry. Um, and one that I've added recently... Oh, oh, I forgot. I, I get a haircut on my birthday. And if it's close to my birthday, then I go like the day before. So I go out and I don't tell them that it's my birthday. So I just walk in, just get a haircut. Uh, I shave at home. Um, and then the last thing that I added just uh, just last year is I try to volunteer uh, or donate. If I can't volunteer at the time, I'll try to find a way to donate. Um, and I, I try to... I use it as a, to keep perspective on myself that I'm not that important and it's the birthday is ultimately arbitrary, but I like the idea of using my birthday as an excuse to do something cool. I mean, you never really need an excuse, but it's just another reason to go and help somebody or, or contribute meaningfully to a cause. So, um, and I keep adding things to my birthday, but that's so far what I've built up to now for my birthday. So I, I don't know, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not, but that sounds like an elaborate 12-step program. <laughs> well, I don't know. And by now, you have learned one thing, that Ryan is a righteous, ordered human being and that I am a careless villain. Uh, I wear the tie and you don't. I guess that's what I get though, for coming here after work. Yeah. I came here after work. I guess I'm wearing just... a t-shirt. Yeah, I just... A try, fancy headshot. I try to look awesome. Teachers. Well, did you see what I, did you see what I mentioned today about... Uh, I walked into a class. I had to do a, a survey today. Uh, to we're serve, uh, getting some feedback from students on a potential new program that we're working on at the college, and I walked into this classroom and I politely was waiting to uh, for the professor to walk in before I addressed the class. But I so I walked in and walked up to the lectern, um, which also houses the computer, and I just sat down and waited for the the professor to arrive. And as I walked in and sat down, I would swear like a good two thirds, three quarters of the class stopped what they were doing and started to look at me. Not because I'm, well, I'm not, I'm not overly weird looking, but it's just, I think I attributed to the beard and the, the, the tie, but mostly the beard. <laughs> the power of beards. I, I, yeah. I walked in, I sat down and I looked like a figure of authority, you know, six foot four bearded quite, I'm a quite imposing person. And I just sat down and quietly s- s- uh, waited for the professor and so just people just kind of stared at me. It's like, what is he going to do next? Should I be paying attention? So Is he I'm, here to kill us? Nah, no, not, not right now. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I have no experience in looking like a figure of authority. Um, I rather enjoy it. <laughs> um, so I guess the first question about uh, pertaining to self-improvement in general is what, what constitutes self-improvement? Uh, you mean non-trivially? Non trivially. I mean I mean I mean obviously things like um exercise or, or even even exercise though may or may not be part of, of, of what it means to you know, perform acts of self improvement. I mean exercise can, can be an act of self abuse. Yeah. In fact, most of my sessions at the gym are an act of self-abuse. Well, I mean, literally speaking, when you're building muscle, it's um, you're tearing the muscle fibers, and then yeah. when they rebuild themselves, they get bigger. So, I mean, technically, you are abusing yourself. So, I, I mean, I, I guess the question is, what 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 is con- a constitutive of self-improvement? I don't think we're going to have a real answer no. to this question, um, but I think it's a worthwhile question to talk about because it's different for everybody. No. Well, do you have any kind of self-improvement that you're working on right now? I, I do I do a lot of self improvement. I, I think that I, I improve myself in the same way that I celebrate my birthday. I sort of think about it a bit and then I fly by the seat of my pants and doing it. For me, self improvement is center it, it centers less on me and more on my work. I do a lot of blogging, I do a lot of videos and, and music and things like that. And I wanna make those things better. And I think that by making those things better, um, I am becoming better myself. I mean, in, in the same way that the, the, I think it's the other thing I, I really care about are, are my relationships with people. Hmm. And I want to make those, you know, if I can improve those by spending more time with people or being there for people when they need me, th- that to me indicates self-improvement. It mean, It indicates that I am spending less time wasting time, um, 
which is not to say not relaxing because time spent relaxing is not wasted time necessarily Mm -hmm. but i'm spending less time wasting time and i'm spending less time sort of being Mm self-absorbed and i'm i'm not just thinking of others but but doing things for others no does that make sense it makes sense it's almost it's not quite the opposite of me because for me self-improvement really is all about um you know like personal excellence so i mean your self-improvement is i mean you're improving yourself but ultimately it's directed outwards i guess mine could be directed outwards because my goal is like you want to i want to be the best that i can so that i can do not great things per se but i can help people better i can whatever it is i want to work on i'd want to do it better so to speak um i guess it's that virtue ethics which we may or may not get around to making a show about but um yeah and what i view I view self-improvement from the lens of um, it's not just capitalizing on strengths and minimizing weaknesses. It's just accepting where you are or acknowledging where you are, not accepting, but acknowledging where you are. And then the willingness to go and pick those things that you want to, you want to improve upon. Um, Not necessarily Excel. It's kind of hard to to measure that unless you're really good at your things. But um it, it has a certain latitude to be to to encompass a whole bunch of things you know it could be fitness or it could be reading more or it could be being more social or um dress or whatever i mean like i didn't always dress this way up until two years ago i was largely cargo pants and and uh button down or collared shirts which i know it's ah uh, grad school i know and long hair i had long hair in in the first little bit of grad school and I, I do miss my long hair sometimes i don't think that was an improvement when i cut it i think it was just it was a, something different i wanted i wanted to i was moving home to be with my uh, my dad got sick for a little while so it's an improvement well it was an improvement <laughs> my my uh, my girlfriend definitely thinks that it's an improvement but yeah my dad got sick i moved home i was gonna be i, I didn't know if i was ever gonna come back to waterloo so i'm just like you know what like I feel like a change, and I went down and cut your hair and go on a hair. journey. And well, I didn't want to go on a journey. My hair probably went somewhere. I don't know. I donated <laughs> it to you know, like, uh, well, when they cut it at the, the the salon or whatever it is that I went to, they collected it and bundled it to send it off to be made into a nice. wig. And I mean, it was like a good chunk of hair. I mean, they could have made several solid wigs out of that. So, um, but yeah, I typically think of improvement on on any one of those kind of dimensions i guess it just depends on what you want what you want to improve upon i guess yeah like i don't i don't think of it so internally like i don't know that that i mean like i read i am reading more books now than i was but i don't i don't really think of that as 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 sort of an improvement in in self but i think that in order to make better things i have to be better i have to i i you know in order to write a better blog post i have to be a better writer in order to write a better song i have to be a better musician or a better songwriter um i guess the only thing i i think about the other thing that i do is try new things because i used to suffer from anxiety i still do but Mm -hmm. but certainly much much less than i did and and I I, I I tell people every once in a while that I am I am braver now than I have ever been, and that is something that I that is a quality of myself that I do measure is sort of um, how willing am I to take a risk on a person or an experience or something like that, and I want to be open to that, and I think I, I would measure that as a sort of internal um, self improvement, but I think that's the only the only thing I really keep track of. Well, do you still do you still do some of the values exercise thing from? the foundation um not really I, I guess maybe we should quickly mention what that is but uh so jim and i both went through uh a program put on by the kitchener and waterloo community foundation it's called engage kw link in the bottom yeah well, or, or, i guess it is i don't put i don't put links over there i put uh, them down here the doobly in do. my pants the doobly do. um so anyways the foundation puts on this uh program it's kind of hard to describe because it's it's different for every person it's it's ultimately a kind of civic engagement program on on its basic level you come together and the the real tangible thing is you get put into groups towards the end of the program and you work with a non-profit in the community 
Uh, so there is a civic engagement there with helping out in the nonprofit sector. But part of the program is learning or at least reflecting on your values. And they do that in a couple different ways. Uh, I don't know. Should we should we spoil it for people who haven't gone through it? Um, I don't want to spoil it too much. But one of the the, the, the thing that always stuck with me is is you, one of the things you have to do is write your own eulogy. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time on that. It's really morbid. But it's a really good exercise to think about what you really want at the end of the day. And every everybody comes away with something different. You know, it's not always and it's it's the kind of thing that you you write it knowing that it's gonna change. But it's a useful thing to write and think about because it means that you're thinking about what you want at the end of your life, whenever that happens to be, whether it's tomorrow or in fifty years. I really hope it's not in 50 years. That'd be like 80. That'd be terrible. No, that's a good long life, though. My grandfather's 92. He's going to outlier. Out, an outlier. No. No. You don't want to be an outlier? <laughs> I, I want to be an outlier. I want to be an outlier on the other end. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't I don't really think about too much about those kinds of exercises when it when it comes to self-improvement. Maybe I should. I, like, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants, but I don't have a... A rigorous tracking method. I don't really keep a journal um, or anything like that. It just sort of goes by how I feel day to day. Mm-hmm. And and again, I measure it by my work mm-hmm. and how my work is doing and things like that. Um, yeah. Well, I think I think though that you may not journal, but in some sense, you're still you you're doing something that is still measurable i mean mm-hmm. real really when it comes to like any of the the talk you're tying or, my mental health and yeah. my self-improvement to the traffic on this blog because that's probably a really bad thing for me well i wasn't i wasn't gonna go that far i was, I was just saying like usually when they talk about goals and whatnot you know goals have to be in trackable measurable yeah. and things like that so in some sense i mean you're not you're not self-improving by maybe reflecting personally like i do that i i journal not with as much regularity as i want um, for whatever reason, laziness, but, uh, you're, you're still doing something that allows you to track it over time. Uh, have you heard of the Seinfeld method? No. That's something that gets bounced around a lot on Lifehacker and a few other of those kinds of websites. The Seinfeld method is basically take a calendar. Well, I guess we will have to find a link and throw yeah, it in okay. there. But, uh, the, the most simple way of the Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld method is you take a calendar and you draw X's on the days and you just don't break the chain. So if you want to do a habit or if you want to work on something and get good at it, you have to, like for him being a comedian, writing jokes and whatnot, you just sit down and you write a joke every day kind of deal. Okay. Uh, which uh, for a lot of people, they're like, well, I have writer's block or whatever. And Jerry Seinfeld's like, no, it, that's just like a BS excuse. You just have to sit down and write it. It's, it may be a terrible joke. And this is exactly what you really learned in grad school. You just sit down and write. And even if you delete 75% of what you just wrote, you're still working towards it. But the idea is you on a calendar, whatever you want to work on, you just put an X on the day when you complete the task and your goal is to make a chain and not break it. And hmm. you just play the game. Don't break the chain. That is that is pretty clever. Yeah. So thank you, Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry Seinfeld. I think that I think that there's actually a couple of things that I like I, that part of it I think is I don't think of goal oriented behavior as, as self improvement. Although I I think I, I maybe should because I when I don't do things like that, like when I don't work out or stuff like that. I, I, I discipline myself. Um, I'm curious how. <laughs> I, I, there's no spanking involved. It's oh. nothing so exciting. I just sort of feel like crap for the rest of the day because I'm like, dude, you should have done this and you didn't. Why? Because you were busy sleeping like a regular person. Oh, really? You're eating food. Do you think that that's good for you? Well, actually, it probably is. That's a salad. But shut up! <laughs> that doesn't belong in quotes. No, I mean that's it's self improvement through self abuse. Yeah. Uh, I want to move on to the next question, but before we do, I want to talk about books. We're gonna do a book report. Book report. Da, da, da. That is totally the intro, the new intro for book report. Um, it's uh, one of the things we want to do. We don't, we don't just want to talk about a couple of questions the whole time. We want to talk about things we're doing and things we're reading and things that are awesome because that's what we do here at Concept Crucible. Um, and I just finished a great book. Um, Fifth Business by Robertson Davies, who is part of the Canadian canon of authors of people you have to, whose books you have to read if you want to say that you're an adult who reads books. 
I am not an adult who reads. I books. am also not an adult who reads books. Uh, well, by that yet. by that criteria. <laughs> well, no, that's exactly yeah. it though. Is is that there's there's this idea and Fifth Business was brilliant, um, in in all kinds of ways. I, I it helped me. I'm I'm trying to fall back in love with novels after reading research literature for so long, and it has really helped. But it's, it, it's a part of that whole recovering academic thing. It right? really is. Oh my god, <laughs> so many novels, but. It got me thinking about can, the, 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 the canonical literature. I mean, there's all kinds of canonical literature, whether it's War and Peace or um, you know, Canterbury Tales or um, The Pearl or Mice and Men. Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's, there's a huge body of classical literature, and it is not at all surprising and yet unfortunate to me that every single piece I just mentioned was written by a white European man. Um, but, there, I mean, you've also got Jane Austen. You've got... Um, Margaret Atwood, and there's just there's tons and tons of canonical pieces of lit out there, and they are canonical in part because they have been studied up and down by everyone, and they're canonical in part because they're really good, mm-hmm. um, or they're really literarily interesting, mm-hmm. and you know there's an American canon of books like Gone with the Wind that you might not read if you're if you if you grow up in Europe or if you grow up in Canada. And there's a Canadian canon. And I, I hadn't realized what made Davies part of it. But he, he writes about life in, in sort of early early 20th century Canada, which is, you know, what he lived through. Mm-hmm. But And it got like him and W.O. Mitchell and um, Farley Mowat. And they are trying to write about things that are uniquely Canadian. Which sounds weird because really the only things that are uniquely Canadian are like snow and stubbornness. And unfortunately, Tim Hortons coffee. Tim Hortons coffee. And uh, oh, and politeness. And politeness, actually, okay. politeness figures figures very heavily in Fifth Business. Like Fifth Business is about three out of these four things. Tim Hortons does not make an appearance. Uh, but I mean, and and it is. But that's exactly it. Is is there are certain things which are so archetypal that they could only be part of the canadian canon if you read uh, who's seen the wind by w.o mitchell which is one of my favorite books um it's exactly the same thing except it's it's not about growing up in ontario it's about growing up in um saskatchewan rural, rural saskatchewan it's about life in rural saskatchewan and it's snow and stubbornness and politeness i think also whiskey but I mean, which is which is just like Tim Hortons coffee. Yeah. Different. So, and I'm slowly attempting to read. I'm 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 sort of trading off canonical books with um, science fiction, fantasy, contemporary books because I mean, reading just one kind of book is useless. And I want to read all the books, but I'm finite. Read all the books. Read all the books. Um. So. Yeah, what have you finished lately? You just mentioned that you finished your Roosevelt book. Yeah, I, I just finished the third book of um, Edmund Morris's trilogy of uh, for Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, you're um, an important president when your biography gets three books. Yeah, well, I, I, and it was it was interesting. So I started reading that because uh, he was highly not he uh, Morris, but he Roosevelt was highly recommended in uh, the Art of Manliness, which is a uh, website that I follow and read stuff about and debate with other people about mm-hmm. its merits um i quite like it i, I recognize its faults but uh, i quite like it so the, theodore roosevelt is often held up as a um somebody to look up to and admire for specific reasons um it's definitely one of those things that you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. you have to acknowledge that there are some things in his personality much like many people where it's plenty of dirt and whatnot and plenty of unsavory details um, that usually comes up in any kind of debate, you know, like, well, this person was a horrible person. Yeah, but let's evaluate their ideas on its own merit. Um, what, so there are certain things that Roosevelt did that are probably not, you know, very highly thought of. He, um, was progressive for his time, but much in the same way, you know, like, you know, you're no more racist than everybody else around kind of deal, which so, oddly enough, my roommate and I, or former roommate and I had a conversation about that, that it's like, 
you know, looking about H.P. Lovecraft. You know, like, he, he was no more racist than, no way, you started to read his stuff and you realize he was incredibly more racist than everybody else around. Yeah. <laughs> but I need some Lovecraft, but yeah. the guy's got some problematic views. Yeah, so, but anyway, so I, um, I've, over the last three years, I've been reading the three books, one, one book per year, nice and simple, and, um... I, so I finally finished the third book. The third book was the hardest to read. Uh, book one details uh, the rise. It's called The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. So uh, birth up until he makes it into the presidential office when mm -hmm. McKinley was assassinated. Uh, the second book is his years in office. Uh, so it picks up right, where, right from where McKinley was assassinated all the way through to Roosevelt stepping down. Um and then the third book, it was a little bit more of a slog, uh, but no less interesting. It's just, I don't know, I guess I was, I'm was i more interested, being 27, I'm more interested in the early stuff of his life, whereas at the late period of his life, he uh, went on some interesting adventures through the Amazon, uh, toured around the world, gave a lot of lectures, then had to deal with a lot of... Um, you know his political rivals and then it went into world war one and how that he like he was affected by that and how it affected his family uh right up until his death just after world war one ended yeah. um, being being uh at the wise old age of 30 let me tell you you'll get there oh well that's but... good it's good to know it's good to know <laughs> uh, um no I, I wanted to to to, to move to our second uh, question which is which is I mean, we, we talked a bit about about sort of how we self improve and and what, uh, with while well, by talking about what we do and what constitutes self improvement. Um, but what is one thing? This is where the hokey advice comes in. Warning, hokey advice alert. What is one thing you do to make yourself better? And maybe maybe actually maybe we'll make the question even harder because we've clearly thought deeply about these questions. Um, <laughs> is what is the most important thing you do uh i find that the most important thing that gets me on the improvement bandwagon is really relying on specific people to hold me accountable in some way uh and for me that's a, a group of right now it's five other guys um, we've all formed a little group we call it the society because we have not been able to figure out a better name for it <laughs> plus delta is the society the uh we we're even toying around with the idea of some sort of like the forge or some sort of uh, uh steel sharpens steel or iron sharpens iron kind of deal um we were inspired again it was by the art of manliness but um you know historically there have been you know, links down below uh, we've been inspired by other historical groups, um, the Inklings, which was mm -hmm. uh, Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis and a bunch of other British authors who met regularly to critique each other's work, to practice and to give each other encouragement. Um, there's, I don't remember what it was called, the presidents or the ex-presidents, but it was a couple ex-presidents of the United States and various presidents of companies they would get together. Um, Please tell me the fight crime. Please tell me the fight uh, crime. No, as far as I know, they went camping. Uh, from what I heard, they would travel around to various places and go camping. Uh, ben Franklin and his society. Fight uh, crime? Pardon? Fight crime? No, no. But they were more about uh, science and improvement and whatnot. So anyways, uh, so we created this group where we get together once a month. Um, and a lot of our self, at least my self-improvement over the last year or two has kind of been... In, um, inspired by or done alongside of the guys where we try to hold ourselves accountable so when i stopped working in the gambling lab and then was looking for a job um i had to improve my resume so ultimately i turned to my buddies and i would we would send each other drafts of each other's resumes yes. critique it uh it's some of them like some of the guys who've gotten more jobs or historically have had more jobs um know you know what kind of things to put on a resume but also i learned the value for example of learning the value of yourself which i know sounds kind of hokey but when you're in high school or when you're in college university or whatever you ultimately just find jobs to pay the bills um, you're just you get an entry level job and you kind of work your way for the paycheck but once you get out of university you have to kind of make a, a switch in your mind and start to think about value proposition if you want to get into specialized work or if you want to do something you have to really show you know what what your value is to the company and how you can 
like you go from picking a job to picking a career like you're yeah you're sort of spending you're, you're spending more time on it yeah so i think my thing um i have been thinking about this while you have been talking um because i sprung the question on you and that's how this works <laughs> but my one thing is surprisingly not naps but I think it might be no it's not playing video games god I thought about this too I was like man I play video games and that's my thing that I do to wait that doesn't sound right at all that might. something's gone wrong here no I think I think that um the thing I I I do that that, that helps me self improve is learn to laugh about stuff I like making jokes. I make funny. Th I, I make funny things. I make funny things on the internet sometimes. I'm, sometimes I just try, but I learn to take it the 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 the, you know, the the sort of thing of that nobody takes it as seriously as I do. Mm -hmm. If I if I miss a blog post, sometimes people are like, "Where was your blog post?" But sometimes people you know don't notice, and I just need to be okay with moving on to the next thing rather than constantly trying to make up for this thing that I am the only person that cares about. And, you know, sometimes it's worthwhile to care about those things that happened in the past. I certainly am not a person who, who believes in the no regrets philosophy. I don't really know that I believe anyone who says they have no regrets. If you have no regrets, please leave a comment and correct me. <laughs> but I, I don't. I think that the, if, you, if you haven't done anything you regret, you're maybe not getting out of the house as much. I mean, I mean it's, and it's okay to have regrets. But you just need to remember that nobody takes them as seriously as you do yeah and it puts them in perspective because no you know not everyone can see them unless you have tattoos of your regrets or you have regretful tattoos leave pictures below yolo <laughs> yolo is over yes thank god um so i guess the final question is why self-improving mean, you see all this stuff on facebook and on social media and really on television as well is just that people should like you for who you are you should be happy with who you are and you are you are you and you are wonderful and these are probably true i mean reasonably true propositions unless you're a serial killer or something in which case stop killing people um you'd be amazed at the amount of advice that you will find that will help you be a better serial killer you know who dares wins or uh you know follow your dreams when your dreams are of the devil telling you to kill your friends just don't don't follow that dream. Follow an entirely different dream. We should probably get back to the positive. But side but of well, it, it's it's it, it's the 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 sort of question is is, um. Committing to any kind of self improvement seems like admitting that you are, um, at best imperfect, at worst defective. And I think the tendency, I mean, I mean, I mean, it doesn't seem like it takes a lot to admit that you are imperfect. Everyone is imperfect. But there is a tendency to, I mean, I mean, in, imper, imperfection seems like the least, the least of everyone's worries. I think, I think the idea is, is that you are admitting that you are defective in some way or deficient. Mm. So why do it? I mean, are you not good enough? Well... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think there's any kind of reason why we should believe this kind of idea of there is a, an end goal that is perfection. I think like most other things, we tend to have an idealized sense of perfection, mm -hmm. um, but you can never really reach it. Uh, I don't think. I don't think there's a utopia out there, to be honest. Um, and I know that you know certain schools of thought would think that anything that deviates is therefore imperfect like once you reach perfection you know any kind of deviation but then it's kind of weird like you get up to perfection and then instead essentially you stagnate i mean you, there's nowhere else to go and may, i don't know maybe some people want that maybe some people are comfortable with that uh i really don't well i mean why i think why not just be happy and be imperfect why try to be better i mean if if you if you if you should be happy the way that you are, then it seems like you you should not, um, or it is it is not worth the effort to improve because 
you should be happy the way that you are. If you are a mediocre baseball player, then you should be okay with being a mediocre baseball player. I'm not sure that I buy it, but I, I, no. I definitely think that it's something that comes up a lot. I mean, my, my answer is usually I do it because I, I do not feel that I am good enough. I, I'm perfectly fine with it, with, with admitting, and, and, and as I say this, it seems weird, but admitting that I am, I am, um, deficient in lots of things. I am not as good as at, at games as I would like to be. I am not as good at writing music as I would like to be. I mean, certainly, I, I mean, I mean, part of making things is always being able to see the, is only being able to see the flaws in them. But I, I can also see people who are doing things much better than I am. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it because they work harder at it and they spend more time on it. And, you know, talent figures into it too, but it's certainly not the lion's share of it. And that makes me want to work hard and be better, not just because I've idealized some version, but because there are real people out there who are better. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I don't know about be better than them. I'm not super competitive, but I certainly want to be better than I am. I guess it just depends on what what your goal is because i mean being good enough just means being better than x amount of people like you have to be Fair in enough, a certain yeah. percentile and then really above that it's just kind of a shuffling around of i also i think i guess i guess the difference is and, and i and i think i switched these words around a little too cavalierly um that is our word of the day cavalier cavalier uh, but the uh you know the difference between defective and deficient i mean lots of people things are deficient my microwave does not heat as fast as it used to um but deficiencies can be made up you know if you have an iron deficiency you take vitamins mm -hmm. but def things that are defective can't be fixed I mean, that's what your warranty covers, is if you get your, your iPod, Apple did not give us any money. <laughs> Apple can feel free to send us money to the Twitters <laughs> in the bottom. Um, but if you get your iPod and it doesn't work, it's covered under warranty. And they say, oh, well, it's, a, it's a defect. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, I don't know, throw it in their giant pile of iPods and give you another one. I'm not sure. I, I guess the CEO of Apple, like, swims in it like a money bin or something. But, yeah, Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's the one who took over after Steve Jobs died. Yeah. But Steve Jobs left the company, I'm pretty sure, before he died. History of Apple, not in the bottom. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that is our perspective on self-improvement, is that it's a good thing to do, and it is worthwhile to be better. And there are definitely different ways of doing it. Ryan is highly ordered. You have a lot of specific goals. I think relative to you, I'm, I'm highly Rel ordered. Rel certainly relative to me. I just, I'm mostly, I'm bored like that's usually uh what uh, like <laughs> it's either i'm bored or i do something and i recognize i could have did it better not that i have to necessarily do it better but for some reason i just feel like like for example being a security guard sometimes ryan is a security i'm guard. a security guard I, I work out of college during the day and i work as a bouncer at night um sometimes you'll do something you know, it's a kick out or an escort or wrestle somebody out of the bar. And then you just autopsy the wreckage and you figure, you know, like, ah, I could have did that better. And when I say I did that better, basically, if you unpackage better, it's I could have did that more efficiently. I could have did that and not get punched in the face. I could have did that and salvaged a customer's relationship because it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You can kick somebody out of the bar. And I, I, uh, this happened a lot more when I worked inside. Now I'm the door guy, so I'm always outside. But I would say a good 80% of the time when I kick somebody out of the bar, I walked them to the door and then they shook my hand. And not because they maliciously wanted to hurt me. They were shaking my hand because I'm cool. Now granted, that's because relative to all other bouncers, it seems we're actually decent human beings. I don't know, like... There is a there is a bad perception of you know bouncers being meatheads as opposed to roadhouse, mm -hmm. you know. But for the most part, you know, like you you when you didn't Patrick Swayze kill someone in roadhouse? Yeah, but that wasn't at the bar. That was self defense. <laughs> that guy that guy was an asshole. You can follow Ryan on Twitter for tales from the bar. Yeah, hashtag oh. tales tales from the bar is, is <laughs> will give you some of the, what oh, I do. 
Um, but so yeah, when I, anyways, the, to get back to the point is, you know, you do something and then especially if you care about it, like I mean, you have to care about it. That's where improvement comes from. If you don't care about it, you're, you're, there's no real inclination to improve unless there's some sort of external force. But internally, if you have some sort of internal motivation to get better, you'll often just sit there and be like, I could have did that better and better will be some sort of shorthand for more efficient, you know, efficient at resource time for, for like time, money, whatever, or it could have been neater looking. Like if you're doing a hands, a hands-on project, like woodworking, whatever, like I could have made these cuts better. I could have wasted less wood. You know, the, mm-hmm. I, my design with the Dremel could have been better, all these kinds of things. Um, and I don't really know where I'm going for it other than the fact to bring it back to the original comment is a lot of the times I want to improve because I'm bored or unhappy with something. You know, if I, I, and I think maybe that's, maybe that's the crux of it is uh, ultimately I can't convince anybody to improve themselves. If they're happy with it or if they're content with it, that's fine. But if you're not happy with it, then there is a little bit of a motivation there to fix it. Hopefully. I don't know. Maybe you just stagnate, but it's kind of like Randall, you know, shit or get off the pot, but don't sit there and complain about it all the time. You know, do or do not. So, and that that I believe is our final word. Yeah, is do or do not. There is no try. No, oh, there might. There, there's there's definitely a try. I think that the, we have summed up that there is definitely a try. Yeah. So we'll see you guys in two weeks. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm Ryan and I'm Jim and we're gonna sign off. Stay awesome. It gives you something visually to sync up with the audio. I have. I have that. It's called the little wavy things on the <laughs> on the program. No. I'm an expert at this. That's too easy. That's not true.